Um, so with that, I uh, really appreciate everybody attending today. We had a great turnout last year. For those of you that were in Orlando, it's sort of the uh, first session on Neonix and we've expanded out from there um, where we had a, a lot of people that applied uh, for this session. So we've got a great number of posters that if everybody could go and show their support and some really great research happening there as well, um, that that would be wonderful. So if we'll just start off here. So our first speaker I'm going to introduce is uh, Nate Williams from North Dakota State University and he's going to be talking about assessing the distribution of neonicotinoids across Minnesota's prairie pothole region and their potential effects uh, to aquatic invertebrates. All right, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, so I guess I get the honors of starting uh, this session off. So um, as Anson said, uh, today I'll be giving a presentation on my research where I'm assessing the distribution of neonicotinoids in Minnesota's prairie pothole region and looking at some potential effects to um, aquatic invertebrates with a focus on members of the family Chironomidae or non-biting midges. Um, so I assume that the majority of you have some sort of background or an idea of what neonicotinoids are, um, but for those of you who don't, I'll start off by providing just a little bit of background. Um, so neonicotinoids, they're a group of insecticides um, that have rapidly become one of the most widely used insecticides globally and are registered for use in over 120 countries worldwide. Um, they are applied on a variety of crop types with uh, corn and soybeans being two of the primary uh, crops that these are applied to in uh, this region. Um, they can be applied in a variety of ways um, including foliar applications uh, injected into some tree species as well as uh, most commonly in the form of seed treatments as you can see on the right there um, where the insecticides coated on the seed uh, before they are planted. Um, these maps here by uh, the USGS National Pesticide uh, Project just provides kind of an example of two active ingredients, imidacloprid on the left, clothandian on the right, of kind of the early distribution when these compounds kind of, when they were first introduced. And uh, to just provide some perspective on uh, the rapid growth, you can see in just a t uh, 10 year time span, um, the amount of distribution and increased use over many uh, um, agricultural regions throughout the United States. Um, due to this widespread use, there was concerns about, among conservation groups and other environmental groups about their non-target um, impacts to uh, pollinators, bees, as well as vulnerable ecosystems, including aquatic habitats. Um, this figure below, done in a review paper by Wood and Goulson, just provides kind of that good example of the interest in this topic over the last uh, 10 years when um in the early 1990s was first introduced. And you can see kind of that gradual upward trend of the amount of published papers um, in different topics related to neonicotinoids. So um, these compounds are being found um, throughout entire ecosystems and, and um, with some of their characteristics, um, they're found to persist in soils and with their high water solubility are being found in water systems including wetlands, um, rivers, and streams. And so what does this mean for prairie wetland ecosystems such as the prairie pothole region? And so uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the prairie pothole region, um, this region is an ecologically important region that stretches from Canada through the Dakotas into Minnesota all the way down into Iowa. Um, and it uh, has an abundance of wetland habitats that are important areas for um, migratory waterfowl and other birds and roughly supports 50 to 75 percent of um, the breeding waterfowl population in North America. So um, these wetland habitats provide um, uh, areas for these waterfowl as well as for aquatic invertebrates that provide food resources for many of these uh, wetland species. And so um, if these aquatic invertebrates are important, um, I wanted to investigate some of the potential impacts um, to these uh, aquatic invertebrates, focusing on members of the family Chironomidae, 
or uh, non-biting uh, midges, as you can see on, on the images there. And so, to investigate this, uh, I set up a series of mesocosm experiments where we looked at um, the impacts of imidacloprid on the overall emergence of these um, coronamid species. And so we based our concentrations off of uh, a review paper done by Morrissey et al. Uh, that indicated that um, low dose or acute concentrations of 0.2 micrograms per liter um, have the potential to impact uh, sensitive species. And so we set our concentrations based off of that and did a magnitude of 10 um, in our medium and high doses. And so to set these mesocosms up, we went out and collected sediment uh, from local wetlands on uh, waterfowl production areas, collected the sediment, inoculated these tanks, and started collecting um, an emergence uh, of coronamid adults um, every other day to see the impacts of imidacloprid on these species. And so um, following our, our experiment, we uh, analyze our data using a principal response curve. These are common ways, or it's a common way to analyze mesocosm data. It allows you to um, look at the community composition between your controls and your treatments over time. On the x-axis, you can see the days post-treatment, and on the y is the deviation from the controls, which is the con control is a straight line going across the center and the different treatments are moving from left to right. On the right hand side, you can see the species scores. Um, species scores that have a positive score are species that are most likely to follow the overall trend of the principal response curves. Um, following before treatment, we notice no difference in our community composition before treatments. Following our dosage, we saw a treatment effect followed by recovery to the, to the community towards the end of our experiment. Um, research has also shown that sensitivity can vary by family. And we know, noticed a similar pattern in our experiment where it seemed that Chironomine and uh, members of the family Tanipodinae seem to be more sensitive to uh, these compounds than members of the family orthocladiani. So um, a similar pattern in, in other studies that indicates that maybe some species or families are more sensitive than others to these compounds. Um, we also saw kind of a slight shift in our uh, sex ratios. We didn't see um, a total skew towards male sex ratios, which other studies have found. Um, indicating that uh, there might be um, females that might, sorry, females uh, might be more sensitive the, to these compounds than um, males. And so, like I said, uh, other studies have shown like a, a whole shift towards more uh, male, but we just saw like a slight shift um, from our control tanks. And so, um, after doing the mesocosm experiments, we were curious to see um, what these levels are out on the landscape. And so we wanted to quantify the distribution and concentration of these compounds in uh, waterfowl production areas in Minnesota's prairie pothole region. And so for those of you that are not familiar with waterfowl production areas, these lands are um, lands purchased through duck stamp dollars and are managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, roughly 95% of these uh, parcels are located within um, the prairie pothole region and provide uh, valuable habitat for waterfowl and other uh, wetland dependent species. Um, and these areas are, like I said, managed by wetland management districts that um, are part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so to conduct this, uh, we sampled 40 wetlands um, across a gradient of percent um, agricultural intensity within a specified um, buffer. Um, we sampled three times throughout the spring and summer according to planting activities. And so our first sample occurred in April uh, before any 
planting acti activity has occurred to account for snow melt transport of these compounds, followed um, by May when um, these planting activities occurred, and then June when um, all planting activity was uh, complete. And so, um, in our results, we found that planting act or planting activity, we saw more detections um, in as we progressed throughout the season. And we also had more detections in areas that were receiving higher um, agricultural use. And so, we sampled um, these basins. We sampled ten of our low. 20 of our mid and high, 10 of our high basins. Okay. Um, a similar pattern was observed um, in our uh, concentrations and our compounds. Uh, we detected three of the five. So in our samples, we um, sampled for clothandian, imidacloprid, thiamethaxin, acetamiprid, and thiacloprid. Um, we were only able to, to detect three. Uh, which included clothandian, imidacloprid, and thiomethaxin. Um, we saw similar uh, concentration levels among those three, and our highest was 60 nanograms per liter, and our average uh, detection was 16.5 nanograms per liter. Similar in our uh, conser or, sorry, in our uh, concentration or concentration um, amount. We saw uh, very, few, very low uh, detections and concentrations before pre-planting and saw an increase in the concentration as the, the season progressed through the planting season. And so, <clears throat> in summary, we found a reduction in overall total coronamid in our medium and high tanks in the mesocosms. We did observe a recovery post-treatment um, we did find detectable levels on these waterfowl production areas, and higher agricultural use tended to equal higher observed concentrations and detections. Um, but it was um, encouraging to see that areas that did have a significant buffer uh, seemed to be um, successful in mitigating the transport of these compounds into these uh, protected areas. And so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge the many people that have helped me uh, in this research and uh, would be happy to answer any questions. Time for questions if there are any. I would just ask you to use the mic if possible. Hi, good talk. Um, so, what were the, sh do you remember offhand what the shifts in like sex ratio were? Like, what was the percentage? Um, from, you're saying from like the controls to the medium and like the lows, I believe uh, it was, so in our controls, it was roughly, um, we had like a 60. Um, We had 60% female and then the rest male. And it was right at like roughly 55. Um, so it wasn't like a total skew towards males, but we just saw a slight shift. And so that, I don't know if it has to do with, so we had many different genera. So some genera are different in their sex ratio. So I don't know if it's that or if it's the, if it's the overall, um, you know, if the females are more, so that I want to look more into that. So. Thank you. Thank you for your, your interesting talk. I noticed the, the levels that you actually found in your monitoring were about an order of magnitude or a little bit less than, uh, than your lowest treatment. Yep. Would you comment on whether you might expect to see similar effects at, at those much lower levels that were observed? Yeah, so I know um, I, there's been a lot more research, I think, doing uh, more chronic level impacts and um, I know there's there's impacts to, um, or I guess they're starting to do more research in regards to um, more chronic studies to see if these low levels are 
Um, and my study was more looking at acute impacts where um, I think more studies are starting to look at the chronic um, impacts of these. Yep. Yeah. Um, Nathan, thank you very much for this uh, good kickoff of this session. Um, yeah. I'm just, just wondering what is the mechanism that leads to this um, shift in sex ratios? Is it simply that the females are more sensitive relative to males? Is it a kind of an hidden endocrine effect? Is it um, related to the physiology of these organisms? Can you a little explain it to me? I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, and I think that's what more research is looking at. I don't, I guess I don't know offhand. I think my, I guess, uh, prediction would be that females maybe just through um, kind of their development maybe become more sen sensitive, but I'm, I'm not sure offhand what the specific cause or why they are more sensitive, so. Yep. A uh, quick question. I see you're on the red light. Um, what was the composition of your Karanamig community sort of naturally? And you, you mentioned you looked at a couple of different tribes, for example, but do you know what the natural community was made up of? Yeah, so we had, um, for my identifications, we went down to genera. So we had um, Tanitarsis, uh, we had Karanamis, uh, Glyptotendipes, and so we had a, a pretty good, I, I think overall we had roughly um, 24 genera that, that we um, identified in our tanks. So it was a, I guess, pretty decent amount of uh, community composition, so. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.